Hi everyone, welcome back to Dave's Math Channel. I'm your host David Tear. Um, today I'm going to do another number theory video and I've stopped numbering them because I'm going to do a whole bunch of number theory videos I think. So anyway, uh, today I'm going to talk about something called Zeckendorf representations. I don't know if you guys have heard of these, but they're 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 uh, they're related to Fibonacci numbers. There's a theorem that um, um, I guess it was named after uh, Zeckendorf, who who uh, published this theorem in 1972, but it was actually first proven by another mathematician named Lecca Kerker in 1954. I guess a lot of a lot of mathematical results are named after the wrong person. But anyway, what the theorem says, if, if n is any positive integer, um, then it, 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 any positive integer can be written as the sum of, uh, of unique non-consecutive Fibonacci numbers, it turns out. Um, before I uh, prove this theorem, maybe I should just give you a few examples. 10, let's take n equals 10. 10 is 8 plus 2. 8 and 2 are both Fibonacci numbers, and they're not consecutive because uh, there's 3 and 5 in between them. 100, 180 is 89 plus 11. Those are both Fibonacci's, again, non-consecutive. Um, and it turns out any positive energy you start with, you can write in such a way, and that representation is unique. And uh, here's the proof. It's not that hard a proof. I mean, maybe this looks kind of foreboding, but... Uh, you have to prove both uniqueness and existence. So existence is, is easier to prove. So let's start with existence. That's basically proof by induction. So if n is a Fibonacci number, we're done, right? Because the n is equal to fk for some, some index k, then we don't have any more to do. That is the Zeckendorf uh, representation or a Zeckendorf representation. And what if it's not a Fibonacci number? Well, then if you, you what you do is you use what's called a greedy algorithm you subtract the largest um, Fibonacci number that's uh, less than n from n. That gives you a remainder n1. Um, and then uh, you write n as fk plus f1. Then you do the same thing with n1. And it turns out that if you find this, the largest Fibonacci number that's less than or equal to n1, that has to be, uh, that can't be consecutive with fk. Um, because if it were, you'd have fk plus fk minus 1 which is equal to fk plus 1. So that would contradict the fact that you've found the largest uh, Fibonacci number less than n. So that can't happen. So uh, anyway, uh, that kind of completes the proof. You just keep going until uh, at some point you're going to have to have a remainder that's a Fibonacci number uh, um, because uh, the numbers keep getting smaller and smaller. And uh, eventually uh, the, the algorithm has to terminate. And it terminates on a Fibonacci number. It always does. So that will give you a Zeckendorf representation of n. That's pretty easy. Uniqueness is a little bit harder to prove. Uniqueness. So, so for uniqueness, you have to assume I'm doing an argument by contradiction here. Let's assume that there's two different uh, Zeckendorf representations of n. Well, then um, uh, I guess it's sort of two cases. Either they both start with the same Fibonacci number or they don't. Well, if they started with the same Fibonacci number, you could subtract it from both of them. And then you get N1, uh, you subtract the same thing from N. So then you'd have uh, two numbers, N1. And if uh, if they had different um, uh, Zeckendorf representations, then, uh, you know, you just keep repeating this process. Eventually, you're going to have to get uh, leading terms that are different. So we might as well assume that the leading terms of, uh, of these two um, different um, Zeckendorf representations have different leading terms. So I call them FK, uh, FK and FJ, where J is less than K. Well, then you can be kind of clever. You can subtract them. So you get 0 equals FK minus FJ plus or minus a bunch of other smaller Fibonacci numbers. But those smaller Fibonacci numbers all have to have index uh, less than... Uh, less than j, as a matter of fact, less than j minus 1, because we're assuming these are Zeckendorf representations. And uh, uh, and then, uh, so you can now write the difference, or you write 0 as a difference of two uh, Zeckendorf representations uh, um, with indices starting uh, at the most with uh, j minus 1. But that's a contradiction, because with the biggest that uh, either of those could be is fj minus 1 plus fj minus 3, so on. That's going to give you fj, fj at most. 
but that that won't work because uh, we know that uh, the, whatever the remainder is, it has to be less than FJ. As a matter of fact, it has to be less than FJ minus one. So that that um, completes the argument by contradiction, and therefore the Zeckendorf representation is unique. Um, so that's a nice that's a nice theorem. It's a very nice result, and uh, you might want to know how you how to compute the Zeckendorf representation of an arbitrary positive integer. Well, that's easy. I mean, I basically outlined the proof when I did the existence part of the proof here. Because the, the existence part, I'm using a greedy algorithm. I'm subtracting the largest uh, Fibonacci number that's less than or equal to n. And you just keep doing that. That's all there is to this algorithm. Just keep subtracting out the largest Fibonacci number that's less than n. And then, you know, recursively, you let n1 be the remainder. Um, do the same thing with n1. Find the largest Fibonacci number less than n1. Keep going. Then you get a remainder n2. Eventually, you're not going to have a remainder. Eventually, you're going to have a sum of Fibonacci numbers. And we know it's unique because we already proved it. So that's all you have to do. And uh, um, there's actually a, a, an app on uh, Wolfram, uh, Wolfram's website. I used to work at Wolfram Research. And they have, a, they have a website where they have all these apps that you can do interesting calculations on. And one of them is a Zeckendorf representation app. So somebody, this is an example where someone wanted to know the Zeckendorf representation of 205. And it turns out it's equal to um, 144 plus 55 plus 5 plus 1. I prefer to go backwards. But here they write as 1 plus 5 plus 55 plus 144. It really doesn't matter. So these are all Fibonacci numbers and are all non-consecutive. And this will work for any, any um, positive to start with. And I guess for this app, you have to start with something less than 2584 because uh, they don't go that high. But um, anyway, you get the idea. And it, it's kind of useful to look at the a table of the first few of these. This is a table of all the Zeckendorf representations of all the integer, positive integers up to 12. And I think you might notice a pattern here. Uh, the pattern becomes more apparent as you, you when you have a bigger limit. But no, there's something interesting going on here. Uh, notice what happens when you're one less than a Fibonacci number, like four. Four is one less than five. Well, four is, is one plus three. Those just happen to be two non-consecutive Fibonacci numbers, but the, their indices differ by two, it turns out. Um, and uh, that's always the case. If you, uh, I guess the next example of that is seven. Seven is two plus five. Two is F3. Five is F5. The last example shown here is F12. Uh, 12 is 1 plus 3 plus 8. Again, uh, 1 is F2. 3 is F4. Uh, four, and 8 is F6. And on the right, they write what's called a code word here. Uh, this is almost like this is another way of writing the Zeckendorf representation. I prefer to write them backwards and without the ones at the end. So I would write the Zeckendorf representation of 1 as just 1. Think of that as F2. So think of a string of Fibonacci numbers. And these are just the coefficients corresponding to whether or not that Fibonacci number is present in the Zeckendorf representation. So, the, the, I mean, the, a code, uh, a kind of a nice, it looks sort of like binary. Uh, you would write uh, the Zeckendorf representation of 1 is 1. Let's look at the last example. You would write the rep Zeckendorf representation of 12 as 10101. What that really means is F6 plus F4 plus F2. And let's just pick another example, say 9. 9 is 10001. Forget the last one. That's F6 uh, plus F2. You can check that yourself. And you can do these for any of those. So uh, you always get a string of zeros and ones with no two con consecutive ones. I think that's kind of cool. And uh, you can kind of represent this uh, graphically. This is a nice graph. Uh, this I showed on the on the introductory slide. What they're showing here, here they're going up to 89, I think. And they kind of color code these. So so just let's let's pick a, a row. These are kind of hard to see. But uh, if you pick, notice notice these blocks on the left. These correspond to Fibonacci. These correspond to the leading terms. So uh, it looks like the last block they show is 55. So these are just the numbers from 55 to 88 on the slide. And uh, if you take any integer n from 55 to 88, the, the leading term in the Zeckendorf representation is 55, because that's the largest uh, 
Fibonacci number that's less than or equal to, to n. And then you have something left over, and you do the same kind of thing recursively. So then you get smaller blocks next to it. So for instance, uh, you know, just talking about that pattern, I was talking 88 is going to be 55 plus 21 plus 8 plus 3 plus 1. And they all go down by, they skip a Fibonacci number. But you might take a less extreme example, like maybe 70. 70 is 55 plus 13 plus 2. So, you know, it's kind of a nice pictorial way to look at all the Zeckendorf representations. They have this kind of interesting stair, you know, stairway kind of, um, you know, uh, pattern to them. So I think that's kind of cool. And uh, um, anyway, that's that's my talk on Zeckendorf representations. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching. Long live math, and I'll see you guys next time.